as a medium that is in its infancy, one that is not a century old, one on which we absolutely have no perspective. Uh, I remarked to someone on the way over here that for me, writing histories of film uh, and writing uh, definitive studies uh, of various filmmakers uh, is very much on the level of writing a history of the novel in the year 1800. Uh, we really don't know where we stand with film, and that's why I, for one, find it exciting. Uh, Pauline Kael is fond of going around saying they're academicizing all the fun out of movies. Uh, I don't think even academics can do that. Uh, having been one myself, I know that we're the people who really love movies. Uh, but there is a, a tendency uh, toward being a little reverential, over-reverential. When a work of art comes along, we know it. But how many have come along? And I think it is much too early in film for us to accept certain standards and evaluations and judgments as final. It took me all my movie-going life to decide a few years ago that apart from having been there first with a lot, I really did not admire the works of D.W. Griffith. In fact, I don't like them. And I question his intellect and his artistry. Uh, certainly not his exploitation of the film medium and of existing techniques. Uh, but it took me a very long time to dare say something like that in public because I had been brought up on the notion that the films of David Wart Griffith were among the greatest cultural achievements of the 20th century. Um, and I question it. Uh, I think we all have to question uh, because time will tell and above all, our own experience and our own evaluation will tell even better than time. So I would like, as I say, having started, perhaps boringly, a monologue, for us to have a dialogue with questions and answers and comments about how you feel about contemporary film. May I open it that way? No, well, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, first of all, I must tell you that I am a, an ardent advocate of the American film. Uh, I think that blow for blow, uh, we have made, American filmmakers over the years have made some of the truly great films uh, in uh, in, in the history of film. Uh, I think we've been victimized a long time by what someone aptly called the snobbery of the subtitle. When we had lived in isolation here in the 30s and the 40s, and I mean broadly, sure there were foreign film houses. Uh, I grew up with three of them in New York uh, that showed you mainly French films uh, with an occasional Russian film thrown in. 
uh, and uh, it seemed to me always there was a Bachin in uniform uh, running to represent German cinema. Uh, but we really, outside of uh, New York, Chicago, uh, one or two other cities where there were foreign film houses, we were isolated. And we were fed the PAP, the white telephone twin bed PAP. Uh, the uh, everybody is beautiful, uh, everybody has perfect teeth, uh, everybody has A1 complexions, uh, and depending on what year it was, uh, flat chested is beautiful, uh, uplift bra is beautiful, blonde men are beautiful, brunettes are beautiful, uh, padded shoulders are the only thing you can live in. Uh, give me an ankle strap. Everybody's got to wear an undershirt. Oh, there, Clark Gable. We had been fed this factory assembly line product of film that reflected the good old 30 syndrome, especially the depression theory uh, that rich or poor, poor is better spiritually. Poverty is very good for the soul. Uh, should you happen to turn out rich, that's good too, but uh, oh boy, I mean it was the nuts to be poor, simple, humble. Rich people suffered. They had rotten times. And they weren't all very nice. Okay, that tided us through the Depression. Suddenly, we are involved in World War II in which Thousands upon thousands of men get to see the rest of the country, let alone the rest of the world. And after that is over, we get an influx of film, and we look at them, and we say, initially, and for many of them, ooh, it's so murky. Looks like it was done in a broom closet. Gosh. And it's in a foreign language. And the subtitles seem to be in a foreign language, too, for the most part in those days. Uh, and uh, I don't recognize anybody. And golly, look at those people. They got bad complexions. They got snaggly teeth, just like you and me. Boy, this is real. This is life. This is art. And I think that without discrimination, the intellectuals suddenly lashed on to the realism, the crudeness, and essentially the innovation that came in foreign films because they didn't have all the slickeries that American films had. Many, a foreign director even British directors, whom you don't tend to think of quite as foreign directors because of the language, have remarked when they've come to work in Hollywood, gee, you know, no wonder there's been really no inventiveness here. Uh, you say, gee, I have a problem. And they say, oh, that's all right. Uh, we had that same problem 42 years ago, uh, and we did it by building another crane and using four more cameras, whereas we, A, did not have that backlog of experience, and we can't order cranes and cameras, and we had no money. So I climbed up on the ceiling and hung by my toes, and wow, that's how I got that cute effect of going around a corner. Uh, and this essentially is what we saw in the European film, uh, an in innovation. My God, when Godard handheld his camera, when talkies came in, they had to stop handholding cameras because of the microphone difficulty, and it was every director's dream to stabilize the camera so that it wouldn't jiggle. And here, in the 1950s, we are saying, oh God, what art. He is hand-holding the camera, and it's jiggling. Isn't that sensational? At the same time, we are seeing the flowering of some fantastic talents. And we meet 
the true foes and the Rossellinis and eventually the Godards and all the new wave artists and Bergman and so on. And we not only appreciate them, but we fail to realize when we suddenly start saying, oh, you know, the Italians, oh, the French, oh, us rotten Americans, I mean, what crap, we're manufacturing. Look at the art that is coming to us from abroad. We fail to realize that for every 800 films that are manufactured in India every year, we're lucky if we see one Sajit Ray every four years. Uh, that in Japan, 600 movies a year, what do we see? Uh, Kurosawa, an Ozu that hasn't been released recently, and so on. Uh, that of course we see the new Truffaut, the new Agnes Varda. Uh, we don't see 500 other French films that are made. We are seeing the cream of the cream of the crop of foreign films. And I think it's that we have to remember that in making our judgments on national bases. Uh, of course, the art of a Bergman is something very special. I think it has nothing to do with whether he's working in Sweden or whether he is Swedish. He, he is a man of genius who has brought a number of things to film, which we're lucky enough to be able to share. Uh, I'm sure I haven't answered your question. <laughs> Have I? Yeah, there's also the terrible problem uh, where European countries are not really as television-ridden as we are, uh, although they are beginning to be. And unfortunately, attendance in movie houses in Europe is falling. Uh, they're, they're kind of going, beginning to go through the period that began here in the 50s, uh, where people are staying home uh, to watch television, as they did here. Uh, but it still boils down to economics, uh, that it is cheaper to make movies there, and therefore you can afford uh, to make a low-budget movie that need not attract the mass audience that American film demands just to cover its costs. Uh, and that is unfortunate. Uh, they can address themselves to much more refined and much more intellectual subjects uh, than you can in this country uh, because of the economics, uh, unfortunately. That may be what the last part I didn't hear. So well, but you know, again, it is time remembered. Uh, I I remember one of the um, uh, critics for the New Yorker, Pauline Kael's predecessor, would never accept a period film. Uh, he'd say right off the top uh, that uh, you couldn't have a film about 1890 simply because movies were not made in 1890. 
And I was horrified when I read that. I said, that's idiotic. I mean, I, who fell in love with movies with Sign of the Cross, anybody here remember Sign of the Cross? Uh, and uh, any number, you know, of uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, the Robin Hood pictures and so on. I mean, the historical film was uh, essentially uh, the way most of us learn cheap history. Uh, we knew Norma Shearer was Marie Antoinette, and uh, Ronald Coleman sold us the whole French Revolution. Uh, but I do think that every one of the films, like New York, New York, uh, like American Graffiti, is a nostalgic remembrance of how it was. Uh, very much as when there's one in every crowd, right? We had a showing of Murder on the Orient Express, and a guy gets up in the audience, this is with Sidney Lumet, our discussion, he says, uh, you know, I went from uh, Istanbul to Budapest on the Orient Express in 1929, I think, and it didn't look the way it looked on that screen. Okay. And Sidney Lumet said, of course it didn't. I couldn't have made a replica of what it looked like because nobody would have believed that that was the Orient Express. I had to, my train is what people think the Orient Express was like and the way people want it to have been because the exact Orient Express would have looked pretty cheesy to eyes today. But when we say it was the most luxurious train we put on a little more red velvet here and a little more gilt there, uh, and the oysters are being tasted and the vegetables are delivered at the last minute, and we awaken that feeling. In the same way, American graffiti, uh, very much like grease, very much the way hair is going to do when that movie, which is now being made, will be completed, it's the way you want to remember the age of Aquarius. It's really the way you want to remember 1951 or whenever American graffiti setting uh, was. Uh, and therefore, it has your contemporary sensibility adjusted to that time. It'll look the way it was, but it's going to be an age of innocence. Uh, and this is, it, it's legendary. Summer of 42, one of the most successful films, right? Because we wanted still, there was a large element in this society that in the year, what was it, 1973, when that movie was made, really subscribed to the belief that if a boy lost his virginity to an older woman, he was instantly made witty, wise, compassionate, sophisticated, and a better human being. I mean, <laughs> this is what Summer of 42 told you. Now, the haircuts are 1942. And the women's dresses are 1942. But the behavior is 1912, really. If you were really alive as a human being, and I must confess I was, in 1942, I, I, you know, the, the whole fake innocence, uh, everything about it, was so fraudulent, but it was the way the author, Mr. Rauscher or Rauncher or whatever, Raunchy, whatever his name is, uh, it was the way he remembered innocence. And it came out as pretty dopey innocence. Uh, New York, New York, ah, oh. 
I mean, among other things, and I say this as a devoted Minnelli watcher and De Niro admirer, but really, it was such a blend of a mixed up memory of the big band era, of movies of the 30s, which suddenly get transposed into movies of the 50s. Uh, it was a total mix up, I think, uh, full of anachronisms from every point of view. Uh, to tell us what? Uh, it was a kind of rip-off Star is Born story uh, with nothing except the ugliness of certain 1940s period costumes retained. Uh, I mean, a worse time for haircuts and a worse time for hats, I can't remember. Uh, but within their time, they weren't so bad. I mean, now they look very funny. Uh, but they were taken right off the Judy Garland movies, one after another. Uh, I, I don't think uh, that there's any improvement in dealing with periods, uh, but I think we bring what, in our contemporary tone, we want to see back into uh, history. Ah, well, the one important differentiation is, and this is true in literature, I think true in many media, that Margaret Mitchell, for example, not being one of the great literary figures uh, of our centuries, when she wrote Gone with the Wind, which I have always thought of as kind of an abbreviated, untalented version of War and Peace. Everything's just cut down, you know, it's just our little old civil war. Uh, and uh, it has exactly the same format, in a way, if you ever compare them. I mean, I would think that perhaps she had read War and Peace. <laughs> Some of us used to in the old days. Uh, but she was basically a 1939 person writing about the Civil War and going around Atlanta, which she knew very well, and places, names, everything was absolutely great, uh, and had the perfect 1939 heroine, that willful, naughty Scarlet, A. Morrill, who got punished in 1939. We knew you got punished if you were naughty. Uh, and so she suffers at the end has a good time getting there, but suffers <laughs> at the end. Uh, but a great novelist and a great writer tells us not only how it is or how it was, but hits the universal truth that tells you how it will be and is indeed the possessor the great novelist, the great poet, the great filmmaker of the poetic vision, uh, who can see man's fate uh, and who can predict it. We're not always aware uh, when Dr. Strangelove, which I consider perhaps the finest comedy of the sound era for me, when Dr. Strangelove came out, people, largely critics, hated it. You ought to read some of the reviews that it got in its time. Disgusting to make light of the atom bomb, to make fun of the military, uh, to, to have what? A scene like that in the war room? And the president and scientists and Go back and look at them someday, they're a laugh. If you look at Dr. Strangelove today, it's not too far removed from some of the better Saturday Night Live programs. You know, it is the stuff of elitist campus humor. Uh, it's uh, National Lampoon stuff. 
It has become an everyday acceptance. Uh, when you think of the way fluoridization is sold as whoopee, uh, my, my toothpaste has more than your toothpaste has. Uh, who would have imagined that 15 years ago uh, when uh, the Sterling Hayden character was a bitter, almost surreal jibe at a very large segment uh, of our community? Uh, Clockwork Orange, the day after tomorrow, you look around parts of New York City and Clockwork Orange is right now. Uh, I'm thinking of Patty Shayefsky's hospital that so many people considered outrageous. And within about four years, he might have been doing a documentary on the hospitals in New York City. <laughs> Network. When they wrote Network, uh, what, a year ago in December it was finished, boy, they thought it was really the way outest thing. When it came out at the beginning of the summer, uh, a year ago, uh, people were saying, oh really, it's just a black comedy. By the time you got your new full schedule last year, half of Network was coming to pass. Uh, one of the big jokes in Network, if you remember, uh, is when at one point, uh, now my big problem is uh, daytime programming. Uh, I think I'm going to have a lesbian soap opera uh, with a woman who's in love with her husband's mistress. And we thought, ha, 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 joke in dubious taste, perhaps. That September, we started out with three primetime comedy shows involving homosexuals. And that was all for laughs in dubious taste, big joke. But half of the outrageousness was already happening. And you are quite right about the vision of the future that the artist offers us, and certainly the insights uh, that a cries and whispers uh, gives you, uh, that uh, Fellini has given us, uh, that uh, any number of filmmakers have given us. Uh, these are the creative artists. Uh, these are the people who are something more uh, than literary journalists uh, who are the true creators. Oh, uh, I think uh, that kind of thing is always with us. Uh, <laughs> if if a, a critic learns anything in a hurry, it's uh, uh, one, one swallow may or may not be summer, but I'll tell you, one movie's a trend. Uh, so, uh, sure, everything's a trend. Uh, Star Wars, however, is going to be a trend just because it's making money hand over fist. Uh, that's the real trend maker. Uh, but uh, no, I, I, I just happen to think that the, the force, this little bit of whatever you want to call it, metaphysics, uh, religiosity, I don't know, you name it, spiritual uh, message or whatever, uh, that's a part of science fiction too, of, of the genre, isn't it? That uh, you got to have the force with you or the power or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, uh, when I think back to 2001 and the 98-page dissertations that I used to get, either from nuts living in Florida uh, or from college freshmen, uh, they all had uh, these 12-page handwritten explanations of what 2001 uh, really meant. And I often thought that I wanted to hand it to Stanley Kubrick uh, and Arthur Clarke, who I somehow suspected were not quite sure what they meant. 
or at least not until 2001 was finished and critics they admired began telling them what they had meant. <laughs> yeah. 